All right, well, well, a pleasant good evening to you wherever you may be. This is the Dodger Game Channel coming almost live. Well, I'm live right now, but you're just not getting it live. Thanks to you know who, <laughs> who I'm about to reference here. Uh, because I did subscribe to her channel uh, after I was requested to do a video uh, on uh, reviewing one of her videos which had to do with the temple. I'm talking about Hallie Everts. And today I'm going to do another video by request on Orrin Porter Rockwell. And RV requested this and so um, here we go. I've uh, I've got some familiarity with Old Port, as they called them. I had a book that I uh, bought at wholesale price since I uh, ran a bookstore for the church a long time ago. So I got to buy my books wholesale, plus I got to order anything I wanted, which was really useful in learning a lot about Mormonism for me. and. I don't think I finished that book, even though it was only about a quarter inch thick, I think. Yeah, that's, I'm sure I read some of it. And I've read about Porter Rockwell other times, uh, especially uh, in the context, uh, well, some of the most uh, useful things I think I've read on early Mormonism uh, revealing things that uh, you won't hear in Sunday school will come from uh, John Doyle Lee who uh, was sealed to Brigham Young yes men used to be sealed to each other and it was so holy you had to be in a temple you didn't have to be in a temple to seal a man to a woman that wasn't as holy so he was sealed to Brigham Young because Brigham Young was essentially a god in uh, the, the then uh, promoted theology there so uh, Brigham Young was destined to be a god you needed to be sealed to a god and he was sealed to him as an adoptive son not because Brigham Young was his uh, you know stepdad or something like that he was an adult when he was sealed to Brigham Young and uh, John Doyle Lee is a key character in LDS history having to do with the Mountain Meadows massacre but when I read uh, his memoirs uh, well, it's not, you know, it's, it, it's been a while, but I, I also created 10 videos, mostly reading and doing some commenting uh, on, actually not his, on, on Joseph Jackson's uh, te sworn testimony, who was the other guy that I wanted to uh, bring in on this, because both of these guys talked about the Danites, and you can't do anything on Porter Rockwell without bringing in the Danites, because... These are important, you know, Porter Rockwell was a very important Danite. And unlike we are told uh, by the Brethren Now in the LDS Gospel Topics essay on uh, peace and violence in the early 19th century among the uh, Latter-day Saints, I'm not sure the word early is even in there, um, the Danites did not disappear just like that. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if they still exist. At any rate, we've got the usual dishonesty in the Gospel Topics essay, and we're going to get into that as well. Let's take a look back on my recent history here. So by request, I did that initial video on Hallie Everts, and I got on her video on the temple and so forth, and then she had her Mormon misconceptions one, and, and she's provided some good um, material for thought. Uh, in some of her videos. Some of them, like the one I'm looking at here, seem to have very little to do with uh, Mormonism or doctrine in particular, but she does these ones on marriage and quotes, uh, you know, out of books that that prolifically use, uh, you know, quotes from the Brethren, teachings about marriage and so forth. So I've actually found her channel pretty interesting, and even some of her, I, I swear to God I haven't watched her makeup one, okay? But um, I did watch the, let the her, her going shopping thing, and I thought, why am I even going to watch this? But I just did, you know, for some reason. And I thought, this this will be trite and so forth. But, you know, she was all about, uh, you know, organic foods and 
holistic living and stuff that I really have been into my whole life. And so I just wanted to bring this up because not just because she made it so I can't be live right now by filing that copyright infringement claim and never responding to all of my attempts to talk this out. Um, I'm just looking at this one here, which I actually did take a look at. And, and she said, it's a, it's a short one, she talked about moving and that sort of thing, and then her difficulty communicating with her husband. And I think she mentioned, you know, she said, you know, men and women, they just don't communicate the same way oftentimes. And she just talks about these times that seem ridiculous, how her husband can't communicate with her effectively. And it reminds me of hearing words like, it's not what you said, but it's how you said it. You know, the way things are communicated sometimes. And, and when we take a look at the Gospel Topics essay about peace and violence among the Latter-day Saints in the 19th century, and you know, we're going to see how cleverly they word things by acknowledging certain faults and then putting a certain twist on things you can just make the worst thing sound like, oh, the church is just so good and responsible, and of course it didn't have anything to do with Joseph Smith or Brigham Young, all these mur murders that were occurring at the hands of people like Oren Porter Rockwell and Bill Hickman and other Danites that didn't just disappear and not be Danites anymore after 1838. No, not indeed. So. Anyway, how they say things really makes a difference on our impression on what the uh, brethren are really all about. And these guys that write the Gospel Topics essays are good at what they do. They are masters of persuasion, and uh, I don't think that's an accident. So, yeah, here's recent history here, Corporation Nation. And underneath that and above it, or below, uh, above it and beside it, we're looking at this one here. And I, that reminds me of one I did by request as well. Um, by um, the, the, the request of Southern Boss Lady who asked me to talk about uh, Heavenly Mother. And so we got into a little bit about, you know, Mormon beliefs there and goddesses. Because we believe in goddesses, though we don't talk about it much in church. Um, goddesses, the goddess over America here is, is an important figure uh, in, in what America is really about and who guides the American company that we call a nation. Um, and that has a lot to do with ancient religion and secret societies, which is why we are looking at, you know, Sun God, Sun Goddess, Lady Liberty, Columbia, Isis, Diana, derived from more ancient religions, the Mother Goddess. That sort of thing that we actually find that our leaders in the church know more about than they tell us. And what we find when we look at leaders of various churches Let's say, just, let's just say Mormonism, the Watchtower, meaning Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, and Scientology. What do they all have in common? We have occultists forming these churches. Churches that talk about Christianity, yet it should be pretty obvious if we really examine the roots of these people that they don't believe the religion that they teach us. They're part of a different religion, an occult religion entrenched in some of the most evil things imaginable. So evil that people will not be likely to believe what I would say about that. Because we are so conditioned by our correlated lesson material and rhetoric about the gospel of Jesus Christ that we couldn't imagine that our wonderful, apparently benevolent leaders are actually something much, much different than what they've marketed themselves so effectively to be. So, they've told us that people 
who tell the truth, well, they don't say tell the truth, it's people who speak out against them, point out their hypocrisy, the lies, the disinformation, the deliberate deception practiced on LDS.org, and the many contradictions in the scriptures, are just aligned with Satan to lead us down to hell into apostasy. And apostasy, of course, means you're going to hell, right? And isn't it interesting how the LDS leaders say the same things about these people as the JW leaders or as the SDA leaders and presumably the Scientology leaders, but I haven't watched them. I haven't actually watched video of them talking about how it's Satan leading you astray from the one true church. But that's basically what all these religions do. They all have a Messiah complex where we've got men who speak with and for God to whom we must be subjugated in order to gain eternal life. Anyway, I'm, on, uh, I'm, I'm about to uh, tie this in with uh, Oren Porter Rockwell. So um, <clears throat> thanks for that uh, request there. RB, I hope that you and everybody else uh, get a lot out of this. I don't pretend to be an expert on Porter Rockwell, but I did, I did uh, do some additional uh, reading up on him uh, from a couple, two or three different sources here this evening uh, before doing this because I want to do a pretty good job here. And like I said, we have to tie this into the Gospel Topics essay because. Uh, there's so much deception in that thing. It's all about marketing the church as this benevolent organization uh, serving Jesus Christ, the God of peace and tranquility. And that's very similar with what these other religions do. But we know they're false religions, and, and, and when we find out that they have you know pedophile rings and and do all sorts of heinous things, we're not that surprised because, you know, they must be led by the devil, right? I mean, that's what, you know, First Nephi chapter 13 and 14 tell us. All the other churches are part of the church of the devil. But we can't have that in the one true church. Strangely enough, they see it the same way, except for they've got this one true church, except for those folks that realize they've been lied to. So... <clears throat> Maybe I'll just kind of cruise through a couple of, of, of these, possibly, see where I was on the internet. I actually looked through Wikipedia, and, uh, you know, they got a little bio on Porter, and whoever wrote it really seems to be pitching kind of the same old thing, which is... Uh, Oh, he was a little rough on the edges, old Port, was he? But in the end, he's a good guy. There he is, Porter Rockwell. I know, all you girls. He's a hunk, isn't he? Washed his beard twice a year, whether he needed it or not. A man of principle. <clears throat> okay, I just made that up, but why not make things up? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not going to be like those LDS apologists. So, um, Porter Rockwell, what was he, like nine years younger than Joseph Smith or something, started getting involved with the church at a young age and was uh, very loyal to Joseph Smith. So, we, we, we see that, you know, he was a bodyguard for Joseph Smith. He was a bodyguard for Brigham Young. He was loyal and he was good. And then when we, you know, that's what we're told. And then when we get to the point where Joseph F. Smith, I love the obelisks, um, is doing like his funeral, you know, it might be nice to read exactly what he said here. Joseph F. Smith. Because basically, it, it's, this isn't that long here. Um, I, I want to go to what he said. When there's an obelisk there, pay attention, okay? That's going to involve Freemasonry and that sort of thing. The occult. So, Rockwell died in Salt Lake City of natural causes, they say. Oddly enough, 
It was on June 9th, which I think shows up elsewhere in his life. One of those kind of strange things with repeating dates, you know? What was that his baptism date or endowment date or something weird? And he dies on that date. Kind of like when uh, um, I was at John Adams and... Uh, what was it? What was it? Uh, oh, gosh. I hate to sound this bad. Adams and Monroe, Monroe or um, they both died on the 4th of July. Yeah. Anyway. Um, strange things, huh? So Joseph F. Smith gets up and preaches at, at his funeral. And uh, he says, he says, he says, they say he was a murderer. If he was, he was the friend of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And he was faithful to them and to his covenants. And he is gone to heaven. And apostates can go to hell. This is your president of the church, Joseph F. Smith. Maybe he was just an apostle. At Rockwell's funeral, apostle and future president of the church, Joseph S. Smith, said these things. So he admits he was a, a murderer, and, and then they go on to say, so he had some faults, you know, little things. But in the end, he was a man of God. <laughs> you know, little imperfections. We're all imperfect. Clothed with immortality and eternal life, crowned with all glory which belongs to a departed saint. He has his little faults, but Porter's life on earth, taken all together, was one worthy of example and reflected honor upon the church. Through all his trials, he had never once forgotten his obligation to his brethren and his God. And there is his Masonic Egyptian obelisk. The Egyptian phallus god symbol of Freemasonry. So, um, <clears throat> sometimes that's a symbol that the Freemasons killed you. <laughs> it is weird when your death date just happens to correspond to stuff. But um, was there a ritual sacrifice involved? I have no idea. Maybe he just died of natural causes like they said. Occasionally they say something that's true, you know. Um, so Porter Rockwell joined a secret combination. A secret combination whose members and those who attended, whose writings I have read, instead of saying that Samson Avard, I believe it was, the church likes to blame everything on, was really head of it, they mention an authority figure from the First Presidency generally being there at their meetings. This would be Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, or Sidney Rigdon. You won't find guys like William Law there. When we look at what we see in the uh, Gospel Topics essay on this subject, uh, like I said, it's a masterful job of... Um, of weaving things in such a way to, uh, they're, they're like a public relations firm, really, what they do, the way they word things. And so they, they loosely connect things, or they, 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 they give Joseph Smith arm's length, if I may read a few uh, phrases from, from what they say there. You know, they say Joseph Smith generally approved of the Danites, but they don't say he formed them. He knew of some things, but we, you know... We, <clears throat> they leave it to your speculation. Um, they don't deny, actually, that he may have known of some of their activities. Well, so the excuse is that the Danites were formed uh, because of, and, and the wording there is often clever, too, because of, you know, you know how bad apostates are. My gosh, they can't be trusted for anything but except for to be traitors and tyrants who fight the prophet. They're there to kick against the pricks, persecute, the saints, and fight against God. Well, 
The only pricks I know them kicking against are like the church leaders. Um, and most of the church members are honest, nice people and still are to this day. Uh, a lot of really nice people in the church. However, the, uh, the way that these people who have left the church are portrayed um, is that they're just horrible criminal people. And so that what we have in the Gospel Topic essay basically starts to tell us that um, the members of the church were so persecuted that they, you know, out of um, necessity, they formed the Danites to... Um, to, to, to really um, to protect them. And they had to be protected against these wicked apostates. Uh, that's the kind of uh, rhetoric we get in this thing. And so what I've read about the Danites is fairly extensive. And I can say right here that the writers of the essay are not honest, to say the least. Uh, you know, they make it look like the Danites were a little anomaly that just disappeared. You know, kind of way that you'd see on television, like with the Travel Channel, saying that's what happened with the Illuminati. You know, then they don't exist anymore. They're just an urban legend. And then they go ahead, ahead to say that, oh, there's a lot of urban legend or, you know, misinformation or exaggeration and, and you know, all kinds of myths about the Danites. And, you know, well, of course there may be some things that are not accurate about them, but... Um, what I've read, not from like Conspiracy Planet or something, you know, or whatever, what I've read from journals of Latter-day Saints, those who were faithful and those who decided they weren't feeling so good about their church leaders, uh, tells a much different story about that. So, um, let's get into a little bit of that. On Wikipedia... And on uh, this particular essay here, there is mention of um, Porter Rockwell's assassination attempt on Lilburn W. Boggs, governor, or at that time possibly former governor of Missouri. Uh, so both of them mention it, and you know the LDS uh, Gospel Topics essay does the the usual job of acknowledging something out there and then just, you know, twisting it in a way, putting the spin on it to make it like it's okay. Surely the Holy Prophet would never approve of, of uh, Porter Rockwell doing any such thing. And then it says he was exonerated. Exonerated? Well, that's not the way I see it. So, um, I've read, like I said, Joseph Jackson and John D. Lee, what they had to say, John D. Lee was a Danite, he was very loyal to Brigham Young, and he's the only one that was uh, executed over the Mountain Meadows Massacre. I, I think I'll leave that for a little bit later. But uh, as far as the Danites go, they were formed, apparently, about the time that the saints were, the saints were, you know, starting to get some turmoil in Missouri. And in, in this essay, I really don't, I, I've read it, so I don't really want to go playing around looking for everything in it. But what it says is that, you know, due to persecution, the saints had to flee Kirtland because there were so many apostates. There were mobs that were threatening the holy prophet Joseph Smith. Undoubtedly, you know, because Satan stirred up their hearts against the one true church, right? But if we look into things, we can see that a lot of people got really upset when Joseph Smith founded the Kirtland Knot Bank. It was supposed to be the Kirtland Bank and tried to get a bank charter, but the state of Ohio said, mm, I don't think so. So Joseph Smith said, effectively, who cares? We'll just do it anyway, without a bank charter. And so they formed the Kirtland Anti-Banking Safety Society, and they just altered the uh, money printing uh, plates a little bit uh, to say something like anti-banking instead of Kirtland banking, whatever. And they uh, 
did other things that seem to be a bit on the fraudulent side from what I have read, like, you know, pile sand and dirt and junk in boxes and then put, a, you know, a few coins on the top and then pile them in the next to the windows of the bank and that kind of a thing to make it look like they've got all kinds of wealth when actually they didn't. So Joseph Smith told everybody God wanted him to invest in the bank and that they would be very blessed for doing so. Okay, that's not a direct quote. Uh, it's uh, if you look what Joseph Smith said, I don't think you'll find uh, that I'm offline there. So yeah, God wanted you to invest, and he quoted out of the Old Testament uh, and and so forth uh, uh, things to induce people, especially members of the church who were the you know dominant uh, demographic in Kirtland, to invest in this bank that came up with these banknotes and basically spread what turned into something with zero value. In other words, it was about as good as counterfeit. Um, eventually, it was good, you know, good money for, it had the faith of the people for a short time and then basically ruined people financially. A lot of people got ruined. And uh, it's been a long time since I really read what they spent, you know, you know, everything about it, but I'm pretty sure Joseph Smith was involved in obtaining supplies and things from other cities uh, purchasing them with notes on their bank which basically were worthless so a lot of people got screwed financially on this and so a lot of people were not happy with joseph smith so he and sydney rigdon rigdon fled the city there were warrants for their arrest for bank fraud and things like that of course, the church just said there was unjustified persecution or something like this in this essay. And this essay doesn't even talk about the Kirtland, not bank. Um, so it just said they were persecuted. But um, Joseph Smith, if you read carefully enough things, you will find out that there are multiple people who were close to him who basically testify he was kind of like a mafia kingpin, ran a criminal enterprise uh, in Kirtland and in Nauvoo. So um, they fled to Missouri, and some of the folks had gone ahead, you know, guys like W.W. W. Phelps and maybe David Whitmer and, and maybe even Oliver Cowdery, if I'm, I'm doing some of this from memory, well, pretty much all of it, and uh, they had farms, and, and uh, I think they were in Caldwell County. So, um, you know, a number of things happened in Jackson County. Things didn't work out too well, and... Uh, some of these guys said, you know what, I'm not into it. When Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon decided they wanted to pull some United Order stuff again and tell everybody to hand over all their property deeds to the church. And some of these guys told them, stick it in their ear. They're not giving them their farms. You know, guys like that I just mentioned. Um, they said, no, it's not happening. So uh, you've heard of the extermination order that Lilburn... Was it Boggs that did the extermination order? Or Pretty sure it was issued. Um, most Many people don't know that that was preceded by an extermination order issued by Sidney Rigdon in a rather vitriolic speech given on the 4th of July where he said that people needed to get the heck out. Might not have said heck. Might have said he double hockey sticks out. I'm really keeping it clean today, aren't I? He might have said, he, he, he said, we can't guarantee your safety if you're not a good active member here or and or if you don't, you know, deed over your property to the church. Hint, hint, you know, guys like maybe W.W. W. Phelps and Whitmer and etc. Uh, you need to deed over your property or get the heck out of Dodge. Because I just can't guarantee your safety. So they had the Danites organized by then. And the Danites, uh, yeah, they intimidated people all right. They killed people. And they continued to kill people long after the time that the uh, LDS leaders and uh, essay writers would like us to believe they even existed. So um, some of these guys got the heck out of town. Um and uh, some of them went to authorities. Uh, you know, you hear stories like uh, oh, the, the milk strippings BS that Monson would tell over and over again about Thomas Marsh. 
you know, was, was he president of the Quorum of the Twelve? He was a, he was a very uh, devout member of the Quorum of the Twelve, and it wasn't over milk strippings. Uh, it may have been he that went to authorities um, to say, hey, you know, we're being threatened, we're being thrown off our land by these re religious fanatic zealots here, and uh, we need some help. And if you look at, you know, some of the rhetoric and the prophecies and things, you know, uh, basically there were areas, at least in Missouri, counties even, where apparently Joseph Smith was saying the Lord revealed that, you know, this is going to be Zion, and if you ain't Mormon, you're out of here one way or another. God would take vengeance on you, you'd be driven out of there, whatever they were. The Missourians had reason not to be uh, comfortable with the LDS people. Not really mentioned quite accurately in the essay. So there were, there were acts of violence, and Joseph Smith was running a criminal enterprise, according to people that were very close to him, including Joseph Jackson, a very criminal enterprise and aligned with other criminals that did various things, counterfeiting, robbery, all kinds of stuff. So the church only admits to, you know, they burned a couple of cities, which they did. I think they burned three cities, but there are two that are mentioned. Actually, they didn't even mention what the names were. I know Gallatin was one of them. So the Danites actually did that, and that was under orders of Joseph Smith, according to Joseph H. Jackson, who was a close confidant of Joseph Smith, who basically said he went undercover to find out what the heck was really going on in Nauvoo. You hear him bad mouth, maybe even in the Doctrine and Covenants, but he was never even a member of the church. Uh, he does say that Joseph Smith hired him to uh, liberate Porter Rockwell, who was in jail for the shooting of uh, ex-Governor Boggs who was hit three times. Uh, I think two bullets hit his head, but not not well enough. And uh, I think he got a shot in the shoulder, too. So uh, Rockwell was in jail for this. According to uh, Joseph H. Jackson, he had managed to uh, get rid of his pistol with a certain sister in the church um, uh, prior to being arrested. And uh, they just didn't have enough evidence. So he... He was hired by Joseph Smith uh, and tells the story in the uh, testimony that I, I do that reading on in those, uh, those, those 10 videos. Uh, he, he went to uh, where uh, Porter Rockwell was being held. And uh, it's a rather interesting story. You should listen to him or, or do the reading yourself. They are very interesting. And he said Joseph Smith also hired him to um, assassinate Boggs. He's, he really wanted him to kill Boggs. Um, he said, get Porter out and kill Boggs. I'll give you $3,000. Plus he hooked him up with like a horse and carriage and stuff like that too. Um, did a lot. So, so Joseph Jackson rode with the Danites and um, uh, on various missions. And he said it was, you know, there, there, he gives some accounts of, of his activities there because he was undercover and he had to do some things he didn't want to do. Um, and it's it's extremely revealing. He's got so much detail in there about Joseph Smith. And one of the things that he really emphasizes is that when Joseph Smith would concoct plans of murder and so forth, like against Boggs or someone else, um, he would always say it was, you know, the Lord's will. In act, you know, uh, uh, so... Um, Oh, what is the word I wanted to use? Um, sanctimonious. Yeah. Sanctimonious. Uh, it was always the will of God because these people were dangerous to the church. So when he wanted to take out, you know, William Law and get rid of him, it was the will of God. And uh, William Law has, I believe, testified to, to um, you know, uh, things he found out about uh, attempted assassination uh, on him. There was uh, a white powder that was administered by members of Joseph Smith's secret societies, the Danites, the Council of Fifty, the spiritual wives, of whom Joseph Jackson said there were at least 600 of the spiritual wives uh, in Nauvoo, meaning Joseph Smith had access to any of these women who were available for his uh, opportunistic sexual predatory habits. 
and uh, according to Joseph Jackson, Hiram had his own special gals there and offered, both of them offered to hook him up, uh, but he said he declined, he didn't want any connections with any women forming, and um, he he wasn't into the whole, you know, use them and lose them thing, sounded like. Um, so these men, Joseph Smith and, and Hiram Smith, according to Joseph Jackson and others, like, you know, Sarah Pratt, the wife of uh, Orson Pratt, the apostle, uh, portray Joseph Smith as a completely different person than we find in our in our manuals. So Porter Rockwell, uh, if you do a little looking up, you might find, his, you know, maybe about 17 murders attributed to him. And here we even had Joseph F. Smith basically saying he had some little faults and they called him a murderer, but... He was a friend of Joseph Smith, so it's all good, basically. Um, hello? So I guess murder's no big deal as long as you're doing it for the right people, right? I mean, that's almost as good as an admission there. But uh, we've got plenty of testimony from people who were affiliated with the Danites that tell us that this stuff went on and on and on. So in this Gospel Topics essay, they try to tell us how, you know, basically the Missourians, it was mostly their fault, but some people got out of hand. Of course, Joseph Smith couldn't control this and really wasn't, you know, involved in the, you know, putting hits out on people. But the more you read, I'm surprised that they, they basically almost left it open like, yeah, she could have been, you know, like telling them to do a few things. Yeah, well, like what things? Because they're all criminal acts. Burning Gallatin, you know, burning down the city, uh, stealing all their stuff. Um, they don't mention it here, but, you know, if you, if you do your homework, you'll find out that they brought the things to the, you know, they, the, everything they stole from, like, the general store and stuff, they brought to the bishop's storehouse, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, it was called milking the Gentiles, that kind of a thing. They're just unworthy Gentiles, same way that uh, Islamic extremist terrorists, you know, think of uh, the, you know, everybody else. They're just infidels, so who gives a damn? We can take their stuff, enslave them, do whatever. And uh, it's all good because they're just pieces of junk, just like, uh, you know, the way Yahweh said that the Canaanites and everybody else were when he ordered the Israelites to go slaughter all these people and steal their lands and pillage them uh, in the Old Testament. You find that same kind of thing in Islamic extremism, and you find the same kind of rhetoric in the LDS church, back then at least. And it, in the Danites, they were... You know, they were basically like, you know, high degree Freemasons in the Illuminati. I mean, these people, some, and, and what we have here is a mixture of general authorities. It wasn't just Porter Rockwell, okay? You have church leaders who are Danites. Uh, Patton was an apostle, and he was a Danite, and he was killed in uh, what they call a battle, you know, they call it the Mormon War. They always use these words, but, you know, basically these guys were criminals. They were like a, that's like a, more, a war with the mafia, okay? It's not like they had some kind of legitimacy. Yes, LDS communities were attacked. Some people, you know, Hans Mill was a horrible thing. But those people that were killed at Hans Mill, you know, were, that, the, the, that, that whole thing is, is terrible, but... What were these other people so mad at them for? You know, the Danites were out murdering and pillaging uh, as criminals, and it wasn't just about, you know, revenge or or, or defending the Latter-day Saints. When you, when you find out what Unholy Joe is about, it's nothing like that. So, you know, they, they give us this idea here that people like, you know, Rockwell were just defending the noble prophet and that sort of a thing. Um... In that how the atmosphere was rough here, you know. Uh, yeah, here they admit that the Danites burned and stole, okay? But they... Okay, now listen to this garbage here. Though the existence of the Danites was short-lived, though it, the existence was short-lived. So you notice how that's put there? That's slipped in there. This is mind control, okay? That's slipped in there as though it's an established fact, Okay, that's BS. It's not an established fact. It's a it's a it's a flat out lie. But they slip it in there as a and as an assumption of presumed factual, uh, factually determined 
you know, his history, and it's a lie. Um, these people know what they're doing. Though the existence of the Danites was short-lived, it resulted in a long-standing and much embellished myth about a secret society of Mormon vigilantes. That is such a dishonest statement. I, it's unbelievable. Okay, so if John D. Lee was involved with the Danites in Utah. Okay, they, they try to make us out, act like they disbanded. Um, many of these people uh, became you know, part of the Nauvoo Legion and the Nauvoo Police Department. They held public office. Porter Rockwell, you know, was a law man. So he, he was like a marshal or something, a U.S. marshal um, in Utah under Brigham Young. And he was a hitman. And these people killed a lot of people. And according to John D. Lee, again, totally loyal to Brigham Young. He said, yeah, Brigham did hits on all kinds of people, you know, but... It was God's will. So John D. Lee seemed to be okay with the fact that, that, that young Brigham Young would ha send out guys like Bill Hickman and stuff to, to, to k kill people who were apostatizing, leaving the church and trying to get the heck out of Utah. Brigham would put a hit on them, and then they'd make it look like the Indians did it or something. This guy was loyal to Brigham Young. Even in his dying day, he was loyal to him when he was killed, when he was, you know, when they, they shot him probably, you know, they because of blood atonement stuff. Um, for, for the massacre at, at Mountain Meadows, which, of course, they just blame on, you know, renegade, you know, stuff. They say, oh, Brigham didn't have anything to do with it. You know, he sent a telegram and said not to do it, all this kind of cover stuff. But Brigham, from what I've read, you know, told him to get the Indians to attack him to start off with. And Brigham was the head of the Danites. He was a grand archi. Okay. Everybody answered to Brigham. And people like Hickman and, and, and many others, the guys that, that in Porter Rockwall, and the, the guys that actually organized the attack here, they didn't even name Klingon Smith, but they named Haight. Who was the stake president? These guys are really like so they're like bishops, stake presidents, high councilmen, and they're also in like the local legion. And then of course, you know, this essay tries to normalize it. Everybody had legions, you know? Yeah, well, they don't all have like maybe they do, but I mean they don't all have Danites. They may have guys in Freemasonry that are heads of them, just like you do like in the police and stuff and everywhere else now. But um Nothing goes down without the leadership telling you what to do. Is generally the way it is. And if Brigham Young didn't order the execution of all these people, which in, then he did order the execution of many people. We know that. And here you've got guys like Joseph F. Smith, the prophet. He's an apostle, and then he becomes a prophet. Basically saying, oh, you know, Rockwell had, had some little you know, quirks, you know, and so forth. And they said he was a murderer, but, you know, he's Joe Smith's friend, so he's all good. Does anybody see something wrong there? So the rhetoric that we've gotten about the legends of Porter Rockwell are that, oh, sure, he, you know, he used some bad language. He was rough and tumble, but... He was an honest, good man, you know? Joseph Smith blessed him to be a Nazarite and told him to never cut his hair and that, that way he could never be killed and God would protect him on his holy missions. And, and, and all this folklore, uh, they want to talk about embellishing. embellishing. Embellishing is what has happened about people like Porter Rockwell and Joseph Smith to make them look like, you know, folk heroes or something. Joseph Smith would say things like... Um, you know, I'd rather I, I, I'd, fav, I'd rather favor a man who, you know, cussed a blue streak, you know, swearing up and down, but he was a good, honest man than some pious priest. Um, and then he attributes that sort of thing to Porter Rockwell. So after Rockwell got out of, uh, out of jail, he comes down to a party they had going at the mansion and, uh, the word of wisdom wasn't exactly being observed in Joseph Smith's lifetime. Uh, Rockwell drank a lot. Joseph drank. Brigham drank. In fact, it even talks about, you know, Rockwell 
forming a, a, a hotel with a brewery in it. That's the kind of business he and Brigham Young are in. You know, they were they were all about making money with liquor. It, you know, we didn't have this uh, temple worthiness determined by, you know, not drinking until like prohibition, in case you don't know LDS history too well. Um, so, uh, you know, Porter Rockwell shows up. They mentioned part of the story here, but I've read it before. So, uh, you know, he gets there and somebody's, you know, somebody who doesn't know him uh, is, you know, is, you know, the, the whatever, the, the the bouncer at the party at the mansion house, Joseph Smith's mansion house, which was built on the backs of the saints. So Joe, Holy Joe's uh, <clears throat> brothel place there, you know, he had girls upstairs that Emma found him with and kicked out like the Lawrence sisters or the Partridge sisters or maybe both. Um, they had a big party going, big shindig going, and Porter Rockwell comes and he's not, you know, he's not dressed too nicely because he just got out of jail and he's a little scroungy looking. And uh, this is this is probably a, a high society party Joseph Smith had going on. And so they're like, oh, dude, you're not getting in. But he managed to uh, convince people who he was or maybe get him to get Joseph Smith. And he said, oh, you know, come on in. That's Porter Rockwell. He's my buddy, you know. And so... Um, we get this folklore that, you know, teaches us, you know, Joseph Smith appreciated this humble servant who was faithful all of his days to the Latter-day Saints, a loyal body bodyguard who had some rough edges. He sometimes used a foul word or two. Never mind that he, you know, murdered lots of people and was a hitman. Joseph Smith wasn't much different than, you know, Jimmy Hoffa uh, or, 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 or Al Capone when you really study what he was doing. He ran a criminal enterprise and murder was part of it. it definitely was part of it. It definitely was part of it with Brigham Young's uh, uh, rule and reign as a godlike, uh, you know, with godlike powers and a theocracy there in Utah. So they ruled with an iron fist. These guys were the secret society that carried out the murders, uh, mafia style, um, for these brethren. And I don't believe they ever disappeared because the connections that we have with high level Freemasonry, uh, at the top of this church and many other churches and the heads of, pol you know, political power, banking, and pharmaceutical companies, basically almost all of the large companies, you will find very interesting facts about the people who lead them and the people that lead Christianity. So many of these leaders you will find financed by other people that you would think would not be financing so-called Christians. And then these people turn out to be involved in the occult, oftentimes in Freemasonry. Guys like Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, Robert Schuller, um, and then you look at the the, the ones that are more culty, like Joseph Smith with Mormonism, Charles Taze Russell, CTR, choose the right baby, you know, in the Watchtower with the J Dubs, or Ellen Gould White, not a Freemason, but uh, definitely involved with the occult, the follower of Alice Bailey and Helena Petrova Blavatsky, who formed the. Uh, Theosophical Society and the Lucifer Trust, now known as the Lucis Trust, with a name change to be a little more <clears throat> digestible <laughs> for the public. They run the uh, meditation room in the United Nations and probably have a lot to do with what we consider politically correct these days, although I think they're based on Wall Street now. They probably only wish they could be based at 666 Wall Street, but... You know, Jared Kushner, Kushner, you know, his daddy bought that place for a couple of few billion, didn't he? Trump's son-in-law's daddy, who's in prison right now. <laughs> the plot thickens. Yeah, so uh, these links with secret societies that are very much in control of our religion and many religions and society at large influential positions in media, government, banking, pharmaceutical industry, and so forth, which controls the medical industry, and the legal system, you will find a high concentration 
of people in the occult and Freemasons. So the Danites definitely fit the bill as a secret society. Their oaths were quite grotesque and like Freemasonry, death oaths, in loyalty to the presidency of the LDS church to do whatever their bidding was, not ruling out treason or murder. So Porter Rockwell, a big part of that, killed a lot of people and went down in LDS folklore as just a guy who, you know, was a little rough on the edges but ultimately served the Lord God. Well, he served the Lord God all right. He helped forward Mormonism to become this multi-billion dollar enterprise now whose stockholders we can only speculate at since it's a privately held corporation and those uh, con <clears throat> comprehensive annual financial reports that the city states counties and pension funds issue proving they're actually being privately held corporations themselves don't include those of the privately held corporations that they invest in such as churches 501c3 corporations whose shareholders majority shareholders and preferred shareholders those who have exercised the most votes actually determine company policy elect the board of governors or determine policy of the board of governors um, the board of directors which tend to be um, selected in a way that we think that these guys are divinely called as apostles but we get our actual word of god and doctrine which has changed a bit and gotten a little more politically correct through the control of the boards of directors which we learn about when we study corporate governance which i've got in some of those little videos that discuss corporate governance um, there's a little trilogy it's been redone a couple times and there's one called an overview on that if you take a look at that you might learn a lot about how the constitution has so little to do with how things are really run in these United States, as they used to call them. And so as we finish up here, we get a bunch of flowery language. Kind of like the brethren are good at doing, like Gordon B. Hinckley, who tells us things like, we're disciples of Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. Throughout the church's history, church leaders have taught that the way of Christian discipleship is a path of peace. Elder Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve connected Latter-day Saints' faith in Jesus Christ to their active pursuit of love of neighbor and peace with all people. The hope of the world is the Prince of Peace. Now, members, now as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, what does the Lord expect of us as a church? We must renounce war and proclaim peace. As individuals, we should follow after the things which make for peace. We should be personal peacemakers. Doesn't that make you just feel good? Well, throughout this thing, so they acknowledged, oh, the people got a little out of hand and Mountain Meadows was just terrible and somebody was guilty of that, but it sure wasn't Brigham Young. And they don't link it really to the Danites either. They just said it was, you know, individuals that... They were a little bit affected by Brigham Young's fiery rhetoric, which is so common on all out in the prairie. We're talking about the blood atonement doctrine, which said people cannot be forgiven for their sins if they leave the church, so kill them, because shedding their blood will be the only way they can possibly be forgiven. Otherwise, these poor souls are going to rot in hell forever and ever unless you love your neighbor enough to kill him. And these are talks by Brigham Young and maybe Jetty Grant, you know, his counselor. Maybe Heber gave a few. And uh, they've got a way of smoothing over these things so as to kind of exonerate Brigham Young. You know, everybody was doing it. Everybody was fiery in their rhetoric. People took things too literally when he said to kill people that were leaving the church. <laughs> Seriously. 
they word things very carefully. You might want to read it. And in these words, um, we must renounce war and proclaim peace as individuals. Um, these are words spoken by Gordon B. Hinckley in his War and Peace talk. When, when he said, you know, we must, we're, we, we're taught modern revelations that we must renounce war and proclaim peace. But we are told this, you know, and he pulls these 180s, which is you know, mind control techniques. When he says, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, told us, I come not to bring peace, but I come with a sword. And then he says he, they, he rules in the armies of the nations. And then he says, God won't hold us responsible if we're wearing a uniform and go do our civic duty by doing whatever the military, the wise leaders of our inspired nation tell us to do, who know more than we do. And what is that? What did they do in Baghdad? Well, they bombed it mercilessly. They bombed families. They bombed mothers and children and men who tried to defend their families by shooting anti-aircraft guns at the planes that were bombing their families. Gordon B. Hinckley tried to connect these people somehow with the Gadianton robbers in his talk and associate them with evil and associate our armed forces, our privately owned military, with the Nephites, defending their wives and their children, their liberty and their God and their church and their religion, all that was sacred is what the Nephites were defending, he says. And he said... I feel like the Nephites. This is, these are my personal sentiments. And he linked the American military forces with the Nephites, protecting their families. And you got to ask yourself, what did the people in Baghdad have to do with a couple of Saudi Arabians allegedly being involved in flying planes into two of the three buildings that went down demolition style in New York? Well, they had nothing to do with it. But Gordon manages to associate them with that sort of a thing and the, the uh, basically, you know, the uh, Gadianton Illuminati that we read about in the Book of Mormon so that we can feel okay about, you know, supporting a military or joining a military that is committing mass genocide in various countries all over the world and especially at this time in the Middle East. So, um, who does Gordon B. Hinckley serve? Watch that uh, overview, if nothing else, on the corporate governance. Uh, it wasn't all that long ago that I put that one out. That one's only about an hour or so. The other ones add up, you know, there's three of them. They add up to a few, several hours. Um, but there's a lot of really good information in there. And you'll see that uh, Gordon B. Hinckley uses these confusing um, techniques, these con to con that they confuse the mind when you say Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, but he said, I bring not, I come not with, with peace, but with a sword. Or So in other words, he tells you things that are opposites, and this is a technique that's used to confuse people. So that then they're more easily uh, convinced to just follow whatever the leader says. Um, it's one of those mind control techniques that we just about got to last night in the uh, broadcast that I was discussing some of those. I only got to like the fifth one of, you know, a number that was, uh, you know, several more than that, at least 15 or so that we we're going to discuss. So I'll get on with that. They do a great job here in making the church look so credible and good, all about being responsible. We took responsibility for some people doing the wrong thing and getting out of hand, and maybe Brigham was a little bit too forceful with his rhetoric. This thing masks the truth so well. The fact is, the leaders of the church at the highest level are not what you think they are. Joseph Smith is not and was not what you thought him what he was when you read it in your priesthood manual. When they say they were brutally martyred, well, they were killed. They were murdered. They were ganged up on. It wasn't fair to have, you know, a hundred guys trying to shoot three guys, but... That doesn't make them martyrs. They didn't die because they wouldn't deny the Book of Mormon like Jeffrey Holland tried to tell us and then he pretended he was going to cry about it. They died because other people, mostly Freemasons probably, decided to kill them. And 
They had some reasons that they wanted to do that. Maybe they were upset about Joseph Smith revealing, you know, signs, tokens, and penalties of Freemasonry in uh, temple ordinances. Maybe they were upset about that, you know? Maybe there were some guys whose wives he'd gone after there. Who knows? But the fact is that Joseph Smith didn't die because he was, you know, wouldn't deny the truth of the Book of Mormon. He died because he was exposed as an adulterer and a traitor. He committed treason against the country of the United States. He had a lot of people murdered. He enslaved hundreds of women in the spiritual wife system. He was involved in, they, they ran a counterfeiting operation. Um, he was basically a mafia boss. And when William Law exposed the fact that uh, Joseph Smith was involved with a bunch of other women in the spiritual wife system, and that section 132 actually did exist, even though Joseph Smith had lied about it and said it did not exist, and that he was not involved with any other women, um, he was exposed, so he had the paper destroyed, rather illegally, I would say, violates uh, freedom of the press and uh, destroying personal property. But he declared it a nuisance and ordered its destruction as the mayor because he was a god, you know? He was president of the church. He was head of the Nauvoo Legion for a while. He was the mayor. And they had anointed him king in the uh, Council of Fifty. So basically, this guy had a lot of power and he abused it heavily because he got it for the wrong reasons to start with. That'll do it. I'm not even going to say it in the name of the age of reason tonight. I'll say in the name of truth and exposing the villains that are at the head of society, including the priestcraft practiced under the heading of piety. Dodger game out.